Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Avi Stamen, and I'm the CEO of Academic Language Experts. Thank you for joining us today for what I believe is either our 16th or 17th publication success interview. Uh, I've lost track and count along the way, so I'll have to check that. Um, during these interviews, which happen on a monthly basis, uh, I engage in conversation with innovative thought leaders in the world of academia about how they are influencing the world of academia in the hopes of helping authors to better understand the publication landscape and build bridges between authors, publishers, and funding bodies. So if this is your first time here, welcome, and we encourage and invite you uh, to join us in the future as well. Um, these sessions are always free. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Robert Townsend, Director of Humanities, Arts, and Culture Programs at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, as well as the Humanities Indicators Project. In addition, Robert recently served as a consultant for Brill's latest humanities funding report entitled, Make Your Work Count, How to Create Broader Impact for Research. Prior to the Academy, Robert spent 24 years at the American Historical Association in positions ranging from editorial assistant to deputy director. So any historians in the uh, audience today, make sure to, to listen up. Um, he's the author of Histories Babel, Scholarship, Professionalization, and the Historical Enterprise in the United States, 1880 to 1940, and has written over 200 articles on various aspects of the humanities, higher education, and scholarly publishing. And as we discussed, Robert, um, we are optimists about humanities, and we are, we are not going to listen to the, those naysayers. <laughs> Um, ask your questions on the Zoom chat, and we'll try to get to them uh, at the end of the session. If you have a more personal question or want to discuss your specific research, uh, feel free to reach out either to myself or to Robert privately following the interview. The interview is being recorded. Let's just check that. Yes, it is. And uh, we're going to be sending it out over the next few days so that you can watch it again or you can share it with any of your colleagues. Uh, before we begin, I just want to take one minute to share a quick word about Academic Language Experts, the company that I run. Uh, Academic Language Experts, or ALE for short, provides customized editing, grant writing, and publication support services to researchers, scientists, and other professionals to help them produce publication-ready texts at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. We're now in sort of the getting gearing up to some of the major grant funding, um, you know, what's going to come up in the fall. So this is the time to get started if you need any help. Um, we also assist scholars looking for help with their book proposals prior to submission to their dream publisher. It's our mission to help our authors achieve publication success and be a source of guidance and support throughout their journey. One more note before we begin is that I encourage everyone to stick around until the very end because we have very exciting news that we're gonna be sharing. Um, it's about a, a partnership uh, that we're gonna be announcing here today live with one of the world's most respected academic humanities publishers, um, a partnership that you can benefit from. So stick around to hear about that. And now with uh, no further ado and great excitement, I want to introduce you to Robert. Robert, thank you very, very much uh, for joining me today. It's an honor and a pleasure to have you here on the Publication Success Interview Series. Thanks, Avi. So it's, you, you know, just re, just having a, a chat prior and, and reading your bio, it's quite obvious that you feel quite passionate about the humanities. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you first got involved uh, in the humanities and at what point did you turn around and realize this is going to be my life's work? Uh, and how did that come to be? God, I, 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 have I have loved reading books. I was a book dork uh, since I was six. And my mother actually put in a, one of what we have here, a, an awful practice called the Christmas newsletter. And she said that when I, when I was seven, she thought I was going to be a historian. Uh, and so I think this is actually my office basement, although it's a picture so you don't see my my grandson running around in the back. Um, but as you can see, I love books and uh, books uh, to me are the the root and branch of uh, of the humanities. And so I just have a great affection for for all aspects of it and all really all subject areas as well. So. Well, I like to call us book connoisseurs. That's nicer than book dorks. But I but I, I, I definitely empathize with, uh, with 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 that. And so have you been involved in the humanities literally since you started your career or did you have uh, twists and turns along the way? My first job at, uh, at, in graduate school was at the American Historical Association as an editorial assistant. So I have I started there and I spent 24 years there before I joined the academy. And so it's uh, it's been humanities all the way down to the bottom. Yeah, that's quite rare. I don't think you'll find anyone probably in my generation if you make it, you know, if you make it two and a half years, you're doing pretty well. So 24 years is, is quite impressive. Um, <laughs> So I'm curious, and actually, I, you know, it's a good segue because you must have an insight, you know, if I'm, you know, going back 24 years, simple math, 
um, you know, back in the back in the '90s, if you know, what has shifted or what's been some of the biggest changes or trends that you've noticed um, in the humanities um, in general, and then also specifically relating to funding um, and how humanities are funded? Is it sort of similar to the way it was 20 years ago, or is, have things evolved and changed? No, I mean, one of the, you know, over the past, over my time, just being involved in history departments and uh, and then humanities departments, what's really striking me is just how much they've lost staffing, in, especially in terms of like support staff. I mean, back when I first started in history departments, like there was a secretary who would help faculty members type up their manuscripts and those sorts of things. Like that's all gone, uh, generally speaking. They, you know, you're expected to type your own uh, work the resource, the, like research assistants have become much more rare, except in a few sort of elite universities. And funding, funding has actually started to go up a little bit for uh, the humanities when we look at, uh, at sort of the federal data on the trend. But I mean, it's going up from such an incredibly tiny level that, you know, relative to like the sciences, it's, I mean, like when you put them on a graph together, you can't even see the humanities because they're just so, you know, so close to the bottom. Uh, and it's only when you look at them very specifically that you see funding uh, levels have actually increased over the past 10 years or so, um, but which is a positive, but the humanities are really strange in that relative to the sciences, there's very, uh, that they're much more dependent on the institutions where people work as the source of funding than, um, than every other field that's out there in, uh, in academia. I mean, it, it's close to, if I remember right, about 60, 60 to 70% of all funding for a scholar in the humanities is gonna come from their home institution as opposed to an external funder when it's basically the reverse in every other field. It's you know only about a third of the home institutions are providing funding for their, um, for their research. So it's a, it's a very big difference between the humanities and most other subject fields. And I feel like that gap has only gotten wider over the past uh, 30 years or so that I've been working in this. Now, I'm curious if you think that, I mean, obviously there's, you know, I, 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 when we spoke, I said, I wanted to stay positive. You know, we've all heard the, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the, the predictions about the future of the humanities. And, and I, I'm an optimist. I actually think that, that, you know, society has no, has no choice, um, but to support the humanities. Otherwise they risk, you know, we risk as a society, um, really you know, terrible things, but I'm curious if, um, you know, kind of, do you think that, funding, external funding is as necessary in the humanities as it is in the STEM fields. Um, and, you know, because maybe there are more scholars in the humanities, obviously, you know, funding is important to take on big ideas, and big projects, but maybe there are scholars that can do things without, with less, you know, don't need the big labs or the equipment, et cetera. And maybe it's, that's the, the reason. Yeah, my colleague uh, on the humanities indicators, he was a, he's a, used to be provost at the University of Chicago, and then he ran um, the Science Bureau for the National Science Foundation for, or the National Academies, I guess, for a while. And he often says that, you know, scientists, are, you know, human, humanists are a cheap date for a university. We cost very little. The sort of the secondary needs that we have are very, very low. And when you, you know, he would say, when I would hire a scientist, I would have to spend like millions of dollars to set up a lab for them, get them research assistance. And, you know, all that, you know, you get overhead, but that never really made up nearly as much as you get just by having a classroom full of students who are, uh, you know, in a, in a humanities classroom who are paying, you know, full dollar uh, value or, or, you know, and from that perspective, the humanities are, are fairly inexpensive. Our research, especially when we're doing research on our books, tends to be relatively inexpensive as well. I mean, certainly relative to, to most of those other fields. And so from that perspective, I mean, I know most most of my book was written out of my own pocket. Um, you know, when I needed to do research, I would you know tuck it into another travel piece of travel that I was doing, and I would spend an extra weekend in you know at Indiana so that I could go through the archives there or in Nebraska somewhere else. So I think those sorts of things um, just speak to how much less expensive it is in some ways to do humanities research, which doesn't mean that it's necessarily cheap for us. And I think that's where I think to the extent we can try and find additional resources for funding. And I think one of the other challenges is that a lot of a lot of the funders that were giving funding for individual research projects, like, you know, in the US, like the NEH and the Mellon Foundation, they used to give individual grants. A lot of those have gone away uh, for reasons that I think have partially to do with politics. 
but partially just, you know, it's easier to give money to an institution and not have to get into reading a bunch of different grant applications from individuals. And so there's some of that, some of that work has been outsourced to other smaller institutions, which makes it a little bit harder for people who want to do their own research to find a potential funder for their work. And I think that's one of the other challenges that we face in the so, so if you're, so if, if I'm a humanities scholar, maybe that's listening to this right now, and I have an idea, um, where is the best place to start in terms of finding potential funding bodies? Is, should my, it, am I hearing from what you're saying that the first thing I should do is actually look internally within my university and maybe they have a pocket of funding that I'm unaware of that can be helpful and, 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 and see how I can get to that? Or should I be looking online for external funding bodies? Um, is it, are there societies that I should be turning to? Like, where do I start my search? Because I, I imagine that if you, you know, the, the probably the, if you Googled, you know, funding for research, you know, you're just going to find science stuff. So how do I start finding stuff in the humanities? I mean, there are, I mean, if you just search for humanities funding for research, there are actually like, I think, um, you know, when I was thinking about this the other day, I was doing, you know, just sort of went online. I think the, the University of William and Mary has a really good list of different funders for, especially in the US, for different types of research. I think, you know, typically when I, I talk to folks, I think there's sort of three different things to think about um, when trying to figure out what a good funder for your research would be. One would be sort of who you are, because one of the strange things I, I discovered, I used to run a, uh, a list of grant and funder uh, sorts of places um, at the American Historical Association, one of the things I discovered is that people would fund grants for really strange and obscure things that meant a lot to them. So, you know, you discover that there was a, a grant out there for people who, with red hair who wanted to study Irish history, you know? I mean, it was sort of strange things like that. So knowing, so, so in, in different cases, sort of what category you are in can be a source of funding for research in a variety of different areas. But then thinking about what your subject of research is, um, that can also be if you're doing early American history or you're doing European history, like there are specific funders that are out there that will give, um, say, residential grants for you to come and do research in their, uh, in their, um, their libraries, or it will pay for you to go and do different sorts of research at the American Historical Association. We had a variety of different grants that were for different sorts of subjects. So sort of subject focused um, grants can also be a good source of research. And the other is just the institution is sort of thinking institutionally, sort of where, where you might want to do your research. You know, there are places, especially when I, I talk to folks from different countries, I'm often struck that in the US, we seem much more dependent on sort of the largesse of rich people and, you know, when I talk to folks in other countries, I'm often struck at just how much more money there is available from different governments to support research on their, you know, on their nations and on their sort of different aspects of their, those countries as well. And those often t turn out to be a pretty good font of, uh, of, uh, of resources as well. So, so those tend to be the kind of the, the big three in terms of thinking about how to go about getting grant funding. Got it. Yeah, I, you know, this is a, this is obviously a question that comes up a lot um, with our services when people, especially with books, right, when people have big projects they need help with. Um, and I got, you know, I, I, I've been asked, you know, and, and numerous times about, well, how do I fund the, you know, I want to translate my book, I want to edit my book, how do I fund such a thing? And what I did, and I dropped this in the chat, is I actually compiled a list of all the potential funders for translation and editing. And what I tell people is, is it sort of, you know, something that's necessarily easy to do right away? No, but if you uncover, if you're passionate about it and you realize how important publishing a book is to your, you know, career and you turn over, you knock on enough doors, you turn over enough rocks, um, you will find, uh, you know, eventually someone who will, will be interested. And, and, the, and like you said, Robert, the more targeted you can be with your search, the better it is. I also quickly found that William and Mary um, uh, list. So I dropped that into the chat as well. Hopefully that can be helpful to some, to, to, to folks here. Um, and I think one other thing that I, I always recommend people to do is start like looking at the cover pages or the, the, the inside page of books, of reports, and see who's supporting that, right? It's sort of like, you know, a little bit of spy work and see who are the, um, bot, you know, who's interested in my field? Um, is it a family foundation? Is it a, you know, research uh, funds? Is it maybe my own university? And then figure out how I can, you know, is, is this potentially um, applicable for me as well, um, and getting a bit creative about how we find, um, you know, funding in the humanities. 
you know, yeah, that's, I think that's vital. And it, it is amazing how many different funding sources are hidden away in nooks and crannies and that people don't know about. I mean, I, I used to administer a grant for, it was a, a fellowship in aerospace, um, aerospace history. And we would get maybe two or three applications for that thing. And I know there are more people out there doing the history of, uh, and we define the aerospace to, you know, to cover everything from flight attendants to rocket ships. And, um, and even with that, it was still a struggle to get people to apply for those things. So it is, um, you know, there are a lot of other grants in my, my experience that are, that are sort of begging for people to apply for that money. So, but they don't make it easy for you to find because, uh, you know, Google's Google pr turns up a lot of garbage in addition to the, the, the information that you really want. Of course. Now, you recently worked on um, a report for Brill, uh, which, which I mentioned in the intro. It's called Make Your Work Count, uh, How to Create Broader Impact for Your Research, which I think we're going to share uh, in a follow-up email. Um, and one of the things that when I was reading through the report, which really um, struck me as fascinating, is that, you know, there's, there's an increasing demand, and this is nothing new, but, you know, for measurement and evaluation of, of, of grants and, and, and being able to measure the impact that a grant has. And when you're in the, you know, exact sciences or even in the social sciences, I think there are, you know, tools and, um, out there in order to help us measure the impact of what it is that we're studying and researching. Um, and I think that I wonder if humanity scholars find this particularly challenging and difficult because they say, well, my research isn't exactly, if I'm studying 15th century, um, you know, Spanish history, well, what am I measuring in terms of impact? Like, how do I even go about that? So do you think scholars and humanities should just kind of forget about that, that those points? Or are there ways for them to measure and quantify um, the impact or the, you know, significance of what they're doing in a way that might be attractive and interesting to publishers or to, to funders, excuse me. I mean, when I read grant applications, I'm often struck that people don't even bother to try and sort of make a case for the value of their, uh, you know, not even, you know, it's like, at least give me some sense as to what question you're answering, what gap you're gonna fill. Um, and I think in some ways for the humanities, cause you're right, I mean, the half-life of a, of a science article is about six months, if I remember right. The half-life for an article in the humanities is like 10 years, you know, which is the, the number of citations keep going up for, for about six months and then they start to fall for a science journal. They go for about 10 years for a humanities journal before they, or article before they start to fall. And that's the sort of thing that uh, just makes it really difficult to, to do much of an impact metric. Um, but there are kind of two things on the front end, make a good case for what, what questions you're trying to answer, what the value will be in terms of these things. And I know that's kind of challenging for those of us who are in the humanities, because in some ways it's the, the joy of the hunt is its own reward to us on a personal level. But I think finding some way to capture that in making your argument. But then the other thing to do is to really start to build networks of, uh, of people that would be interested in your subject that you can then push your, your work out to as soon as uh, the work comes out so that then you're starting to get some, some feedback and some things that you can cite back in terms of being able to report back to your funders. Um, I mean, I know we do that with the humanities indicators all the time in terms of trying to say, like, look, you know, as soon as I, I publish something, I have a, a set of news people that I know will be interested in this subject that I'll push this out to. I've got LinkedIn, Facebook, uh, Twitter. I'm pushing it out to those sorts of folks. And then I'm just sort of tracking and seeing like, where is this cited? Where is, uh, you know, where are people covering this? And then the, just using those citations to, to start to make the case because the, you know, the, the true science of impact is just something that humanities people are never gonna be able to do. Uh, and so I think to the extent we can just simply demonstrate that there are people who are interested, that we're answering important questions and there are people who are interested in our work. I think we're doing about I think you would be setting yourself above most of the people in the humanities who are getting grants in a lot of these different areas, because in my experience, not a lot of people even even tried to do that. Right. Just from what I understand from what you're saying is just demonstrating that you actually care that people read your work. And it's not just a matter of you doing it to fulfill, you know, your own interests, but actually paying attention to are there you know, A is, are there people who are going to read it? But B is maybe might it have an impact on beyond the ivory tower? I think that's maybe something that gets overlooked as well. I think there's a values-based argument to make for some of the research in today's academia to say, 
um, I'm thinking through issues which maybe society is contending with um, on a moral or philosophical level, and I have something to contribute. And I wonder if that in itself, um, you know, again, it's hard to measure what's an impact on society, but I think even just making that argument and explaining, taking it one step further beyond just, well, I'm curious about the subject, but actually um, this, has, this might have real world implications, even if it is 15th century history, you know, because I, I think that, you know, uh, maybe that can kind of uh, be appealing to, to, to funders. God knows the classicists are having all sorts of uh, very contemporary discussions about the the impact and, and importance of their work. And I think if if they can make an argument, then I think a lot of the rest of us can make that argument as well. Yes, we have a, we have a joke in the office um, when we get rush a rushed archaeology project that it's been under the ground for two thousand years. You know, if it takes us one more day to finish up the editing um, properly, then you know it will probably be okay. But um, but obviously, you know, we do our utmost to get every uh, everything on time. Um, now, how you mentioned a few just social media sites. Are there other um, other channels or other media or other you know uh, maybe methods? that you've seen researchers take to get their research out there that you've thought are particularly creative, innovative, have done really well, you know, I don't want to say go viral because I don't like that, but you know, that have really kind of caught on in a, in a, in a good way, in a positive way. I mean, I see some people use their Twitter feeds in ways that I think are just really interesting and creative and, and that, and then when they actually have something that they want to sell, like they've created and curated an audience that then they can pop that into. And then it, you know, and then it really, uh, uh, really sails. Uh, in um, some of the other things I see people do is just basically keep a uh, a mailing list of the people that they're in contact with, that they're work, you know, that they're in communications with, and then, you know, just shoot a, a message out to them when you have uh, an update or something. I mean, you got to be careful that you don't sort of annoy people. But if you can create an audience, I mean, we've done I, we did that when I joined the Humanities Indicators team. Is I just started collecting emails from people, and so as soon as I, um, you know, we do an update, I've got fifteen hundred people that I can blast that out to, and then I see those among those fifteen hundred people. I know there are people that write editorials. There are people at the National Endowment for the Humanities, so they see that you know I'm making an effort to try and communicate the work that they're helping to fund. And from that perspective, those sorts of things, I think, can be really useful just in terms of helping uh, helping your funder feel like. The next time I come back to that person, well, this, this is somebody who's actually making an effort to, to like, to take my money and make it so that it actually has value and impact that, that you know, sort of ripples out beyond, um, you know, just putting it up on the web and hoping that people will see it and discover it on their own. Can you can you tell us a little bit about humanities indicators? Um, and for those who aren't familiar, basically, we created the humanities indicators. Not, gosh, 13 years ago now, in order to try and make, uh, to, to demonstrate, uh, just to track the health of the humanities. It's a public website that, uh, where we basically, we started just by taking a lot of available data, massaging it and curating it and putting it in a language that we hope humanists would find useful and be able to, uh, to, to uh, sort of use to make cases for in, within their own institutions and those sorts of things. And since then, we've started to sort of add additional research programs. We did a large survey of the, uh, the American public about how they engage with the humanities, how they feel about the humanities a couple of years ago. And we've done some other studies lately just about sort of what becomes of humanities majors, where we, you know, we buy some data from Gallup at, that shows that humanities majors are happy. You know, they're, after they graduate, they're happy. They make a good middle class living. It's, uh, you know, sort of trying to put the lie to the, uh, the perception that everybody ends up as baristas and miserable and impoverished after they uh, they graduate with humanities degrees. The numbers don't show that, and we're happy to put that together and provide it as a resource, a uh, free resource for people to to have and use. Interesting, interesting. So it's 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 really just trying to, you know, put, put more of a scientific lens over some of the, you know, po uh, popular talking points that may not be actually, you know, drawn out when you when you actually look at things in a little bit more depth. Yeah, I mean, there, there's a science and engineering engineer indicators, which comes out every couple of years, and they use it to make the case that, oh, my God, we're not paying enough in the way of the sciences. And so really, that was the impetus for creating uh, the humanities indicators was the was they realized that the sciences were kind of eating our lunch just because they had more and better data about 
their needs and their sort of issues. And, um, and so basically we created as a, as a pilot project that we were gonna to give to the National Endowment for the Humanities and the NEH decided, because they had just taken some funding cuts, that they really didn't want it. So the Mellon Foundation has uh, given us an endowment to, to make this a, an ongoing project. Got it. Um, all right, I wanna, I wanna uh, turn now to your, to talk a little bit about your time uh, at the American Hist Historical Association, because I think that there are probably um, those here who would find that really, you know, uh, quite interesting. Um, and can you tell us a little bit, a little bit about AHA and, and, and what they do and, and your role uh, there? I mean, the Ameri I mean, like all scholar societies, the, the main purpose of, this, of it is to basically provide a space and an advocacy space for the, uh, the members of the discipline, an outlet for their research, an outlet for their, their sort of questions and concerns. And then, uh, you know, they, we were based in, we were, I should say I was, based in DC um, to, so that we could work with folks on Capitol Hill to try and get legislation that would advance and support the, the health of the humanities. In addition to that, I was, as I was, I was director of publications there. So I also, publications and research. So I tracked the, a lot of the numbers about the humanities, but I also, you know, was publishing a lot of different, uh, uh, you know, we, we published sort of small monographs. We published a, a magazine about uh, the state of the, the humanities or the professional things. We did the American Historical Review, which was a more traditional uh, journal uh, and, you know, things like a directory of history departments. Um, so we provided a, a sort of a wealth of different resources for people to sort of know about the field and to provide information. And then we had an annual meeting uh, that would also provide an opportunity for people to get together and share their uh, their sort of new and original research while it's in development. Are, are historical societies, or, or really any societies, you know, uh, um, scholarly societies, also potentially a uh, a source of funding, or is that or is that not really their major role? Oh yeah, yeah. No, we we had uh, I believe we had three different fellowships. The I mean the aerospace. We did one for American history that we did with the was the Jameson Fellowship, which provided a sort of a, a residential fellowship for about three months. Uh, uh, the uh, you know where people could come to the Library of Congress, and uh, and then we we had sort of broader ones for legal history and um, and sort of you know foreign studies where we would provide some small uh, travel grants and those sorts of things. So we had a, a variety of different um, sorts of fellowships. And I should probably be able to name more of them off the top of my head, but I, uh, that, but there are there are quite a few. It's uh, you know it's one of those things where you, I believe you have to be a member in order to be able to to sign up for them. But they're still you know they could range from fifteen you know up to about fifteen hundred dollars, which would at least give you a, a decent you know start on a on a on a small trip. Yeah, yeah, I think that's sort of maybe one of the challenges for scholars is that. You know, there, there, there are those opportunities, and and usually universities are sending out, you know, but just to sift through and figure out what's really relevant to you. So, you know, the more targeted you can be in terms of being on the specific um, listservs or you know being subscribed to the specific society which is most relevant to you, and not just you know humanities in general, but actually try and dig down, um, then you can really kind of be on the up and up about funding that comes through. And yes, it takes up, you know, a couple of minutes of your time going through those emails and through those digests um, every day. And, and that's, you know, but, but, but you'll be aware of the opportunities. And, and from what I've seen, it's not, it's funding opportunities, but it's also publication opportunities. There may be special issues in, in, in some of these, you know, journals um, that if you are paying attention, you may notice something that others, um, you know, sort of gloss over or say to themselves, oh, you know, that's the last thing I need is to fill out another application for more funding. Um, but like you said before, Robert, it could very well be that in this particular case, if you're well suited, um, you may the competition may be high or it may not be as high, and and it, you may have a decent chance of of winning. Yeah, I think I think people often tend to overestimate how much competition there is for uh, a lot of these grants. Yeah, and I think also the other thing that I've noticed, and I don't know if this is as much in the humanities, but definitely in the sciences. Uh, a grant itself has sort of become a currency that you can put on your CV, meaning it's not only a means to an end, but it actually has become an end itself in the sense that if you have been awarded a few, you know, uh, uh, nice grants, um, you've built up over time, you start with some smaller travel grants, and then you kind of build up to the bigger grants, that in itself, it demonstrates um, a certain level of competency in your field and actually, you know, can be considered when 
you're up for promotion or when you're being, you know, applying for jobs. But it also lets you leverage, I, in, in some cases, it lets you leverage funding from your institution as well. Mm -hmm. um, I've known a number of people who've been able to say, you know, we got a beverage grant from the American Historical Association for $1,500, but I need, you know, in, I need 3000 in order to make this trip, um, you know, and they can go to their dean and their dean often will top up uh, that difference, not often, but it, it, I've known it to happen. And so from that perspective, having that sort of peer review validation for your research can be leveraged into, you know, either another funder, because frankly, I know some of the, the uh, committees that I've been on looking at grant applications, when we see that it's been validated by, you know, a prestigious group, it's like, well, that, that, that does sort of suggest that this is somebody who, you know, whose work we should take, uh, we can take more seriously than somebody who, you know, just comes in and they're, they've got the rough outline of an idea and they don't really know where they're going with it. Um, it does create a certain unfairness in the, the system though, because it's clear that some institutions are doing a much better job of helping people write up these grant applications. And I think to the extent, I, I do wish, I do wish I could figure out a way to, to, to help people, you know, develop better grant writing skills and that sort of thing, both in terms of their ability to support their research. But then if an academic career, they, you know, if they go out into like the, the nonprofit sector, like those are skills that are, can be quite useful uh, for those. I mean, they've been useful for me and I'd be, I think they'd be useful for anybody else who wanted to uh, sort of step out of academia into, uh, a, into the workforce outside of uh, uh, the, ac yeah. the academy. No doubt. I, I mean, I can say because this is this is something we do a lot of in our company, which is grant writing, um, or it's really more. And, and I actually don't define it as grant writing because we believe that you know the scholars should at least be the ones who are putting pen to paper or, or or typing up their proposal, and then we can you know kind of come in and help and give them guidance and 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 you know steer them in the right direction. Um, but it is a unique sort of writing skill because you know articles. First of all, you get a lot more practice with articles generally than you do with grant writing. Um, but the grant writing has. You know, it's not just writing up your results of your research in sort of an unbiased way, but you actually have to think about the funding body. What what are they interested in? What have they funded in the past? Um, what makes them tick? What are they looking at for the future? What are their priority areas? You know, are they looking for theoretical research, practical research? Do they want a real world impact? There's a lot of things that there's a lot of like, you know, uh, variables that go into that. Um, so I agree with you, you know, practice makes perfect in that sense of, of, of uh, you know, doing it as much as you can and getting good, you know, getting good at it. But I think it, it sort of, you know, may present a unique challenge to scholars who are used to kind of writing, you know, just the results of their research, which doesn't really have, you know, a, a salesy or marketing -y or, you know, it doesn't have a pitch to it. Whereas I think grants maybe, you know, require a little bit more, um, you know, job of thinking about who the audience is and tailoring it to them. I mean, I'll tell you one of the things that I'm most struck by when I read uh, applications for both grants and fellowships is how little evidence a lot of people demonstrate that they've actually read the ad or the description of what it is. And, you know, I think people would vastly improve their their applications just by deconstructing that the language in that and then making that a checklist uh, of things that they want to make sure they touch on in their in the, either in their cover letter or in their application, because, you know, I can say from experience, we spend a lot of time sort of figuring out what we want to put into in, in terms of language. And we really, I mean, when, you know, I just did a fellowship uh, application where I got 126 applications and, you know, the people who didn't bother to even like sort of respond to more than half of the things that I had in that application, it's like they just moved to the other side of the pile because it was like, you know, I got all these people over here who have told me that they can do the things that I want them to do. And so I think that's also the case with grant applications as well. It's a, I mean, it's just, to me, it seems like a pretty simple technique and I wish more people would do it. Yeah, no, that's the, the, that's for sure true. And I think that, you know, sometimes people have their research already kind of in their minds and then they try to take a square and put it into a, you know, a square peg and fit it into a circle and it just doesn't work and it, and it feels forced. And what I try, you know, I got, I was actually on a call yesterday with a scholar who was trying to ask me how um, she could take her very pragmatic research and turn it into theoretical so that she could win a grant. And I said, well, maybe that's not the best way to do it. Um, and, and I think there's just, you know, we're, we're, we're so kind of 
knee deep into our own research that sometimes, you know, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, maybe not every, you know, even if there's big money, big dollar signs, or if, you know, our university is pushing it, maybe that's not the best fund for us. And maybe it's better to apply to somewhere that's a little bit less well known, but, uh, you know, and, and maybe is a little bit less money, but I actually have a greater chance of winning because it's a matter of my time and efforts and energies um, to put into it. So yeah, you're, I mean, you know, it's sort of like at nauseum telling people, read the instructions, read the guidelines, but I would say it's beyond, I, I, I'd even say that sometimes that could be boring um, as an ex outsider who, who, you know, especially if there are long, complicated and convoluted instructions. What I find to be really helpful is if you can get your hands on a previous uh, proposal that has done well and that has won, especially in your field, that kind of opens up the door to thinking, okay, I see what they did. I'm going to try and adapt that to my, what I'm working on and see if that works. Yeah, no, that's very true. Okay. And um, often, I mean, people like me would be willing to, to share that with you, or at least offer advice on on that. So, I mean, in some ways looking for the grant administrator and getting in touch with them can also often be useful as well. Because I mean, for, for their purposes, we want more applicants and to the extent we can be helpful in convincing somebody to apply, that's part of our job. That's really interesting. Cause my guess would be that, you know, a lot of scholars probably feel like, oh, the last thing they want to do is hear from, you know, uh, 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 you know, one of their applicants is being a nudge to try and understand all the little nuances of the application. But it sounds like you're saying, don't, you know, don't hesitate, reach out, you know, don't, don't yeah. WhatsApp at one o'clock in the morning, but, uh, you know, do be in touch and be communicative because that can actually help. And, and I wonder if also, you know, subconsciously that name sort of sticks, if they are asking intelligent, timed, well-informed, well-informed questions, you know, I, I imagine that that probably could stick somewhere in the back of your brain, like, oh, you know, this person, you know, seems to be on the ball, um, you know, and if they do have a good proposal that may, may work in their favor. That, you know, since, since we tend to have sort of blind peer review that uh, it, 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 from uh, that perspective, I would say it can't hurt you to ask people like me to, to give you some advice because, you know, our job is to get people to apply and then to, to give it to the committee to, to, to review. It. And so I think that's really but where we can help. Got it. So the peer, I guess, does it work similar to the journal that the peer reviewers will come back with a with their recommendations and then you make the final determination about who's getting funding and who's not is that accurate no they they tend to make the final determination who gets funding for reviewers uh, in, both it. both who and 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 the value amounts if uh you know like at the aha we have you know sort of a pot of money and then they you know it needs to be split up between however many applicants they find uh worthy got it that makes sense that makes sense and is that you know it, are there, you know, I know this is a bit generic, but are there sort of, when you were, I, I, I don't know if you did any review, you were sort of managing the grants, but were there sort of, you know, classic mistakes that you saw a lot of scholars making that you would say, you know, aside from, you know, read the instructions and make sure that they're in line, were there things that kind of repeated themselves that you said, you know, it's, a, you know, if you are sort of starting from scratch, make sure not to do, you know, this, I mean, I think the biggest problem tends to be the, the one you identified, which was don't, you know, you, you, you have, I mean, sometimes, and you know, I know from when I was writing, you know, doing my dissertation and turning it into a book, it's like, you've got so much in your head that you're, you, it, you want to explode, but you're also sort of thinking so narrowly about all the details that are within the, the scope of your, of your story that you forget that you have to communicate to a bunch of people who have never, in a lot of cases, never heard anything about this. And, you know, so figuring out kind of the elevator pitch version of your, of your thesis and making kind of foregrounding that for an audience of people that, you know, you're going to have to sort of bring over to your side. I think that's, that tends to be one of the bigger problems that I see in, uh, in these sorts of grant applications. Well, let me ask you about that then. I imagine that the reviewers do have a familiarity with the field. So is it a matter of striking a balance between writing it in a generic enough way and intelligent enough way that anyone, you know, who's you know, interested and intelligent can understand it, but then it also has elements of the, you know, niche specific uh, field or are the reviewers also not necessarily experts in, in that particular field? I mean, typically what we get, I mean, you know, like we have one, we had one grant that was like all of American history and it was, you know, and so you, you know, you get say five people on a committee who are, uh, who can sort of be very expert in this, subject of the you know of say 18th century intellectual history um but if you know you want you have a grant that you're applying for that's 20th century social history 
uh, you need to figure out how you can sort of make the case to somebody, to a group of people that are going to be specialists in a variety of different uh, sort of micro fields. Uh, and so sort of figuring out how you start by speaking to that broad group and then sort of coming down and also then speaking to any specialist who might be on that committee. I think that's the that's the sort of the, the fine art that I think of, often people people just tend to start on the micro and then just hope that they they happen to land on people who will buy into that. And I think that's that tends to be a, a little bit of the, the challenge. And I think part of part of it, too, is that if you know what your elevator pitch is and you can make it right up at the front, it also helps with the impact uh, conception, because the often that's when you're you know, you're the most uh, able to articulate what the the impact value or the value proposition beyond your sort of micro subject is going to be. And so I think that's where part of the value where you can sort of add value in terms of making that case. Yeah, I always tell scholars that, you know, do, don't make the mistake of, of making your pitch or even your article into a novel where, you know, you got to wait to the last page to reveal who, you know, who really who done it. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. not that that will not work in academia. You want to take like your biggest insight, your biggest, you know, uh, your most ambitious goal, uh, your biggest challenge and put it out, put it out there from the very start, because, um, you know, and I, I don't want to land uh, land you in it, but I did see a uh, not 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 uh, about your organization, but I did see a, a study about what it is that reviewers are reading when they read, ar you know, articles or, or, or submissions. And it was pretty shocking that they themselves admitted that most of them are, you know, starting with the abstracts and the titles. And if that's not, you know, blowing you away, then it goes in the, you know, in the hold pile. Um, and that is understandable. You know, there's a small pool of resources that are available to really check these in depth. And you want to make sure you're spending the time with the ones that really have the most potential. So I think it's even all the more important to not say, oh, I'll write an abstract to, you know, the last minute, um, you know, because I have to, but actually think, you know, and it's okay to write the abstract last. I do recommend doing that after you have your thoughts collected in order, but actually spend the most time on that um, because it can be so critical to, you know, to jumping off the page, which is really what you want to do. Yeah, I mean, for years, we, we had a struggle at the American Historical Association. Like, could we ask authors to do abstracts? And for years, we did not ask them to do abstracts because, history is a narrative and it's told and you know and so it was just the idea that you you couldn't ask a historian to write an abstract about something that was needed to be told in you know in its own way and uh, compressing it into a paragraph was somehow sort of contrary to that which I, I always found kind of intriguing as somebody who sort of straddles that line between social science and the humanities is that still the case do they still not uh, require abstracts i think they finally gave in and started to do that, yeah. Realized that, that it makes makes life much easier, right? Um, so I, I'm curious if you could just, uh, you know, I, first of all, um, it's really been fascinating. I know I've learned a lot in the last 45 minutes um, and I wanna, I wanna make sure that we leave time for, for some Q&A for anyone who's, who's is interested. Um, but I'm curious if you could just summarize by just telling us a little bit about, you know, you know, your experience at you know the American Historical Association and now uh, in your current role, um, kind of what takeaways can you impart to researchers and authors in the humanities? Um, how do you see the next you know five ten years um, evolving, and and how can individual scholars you know sort of uh, track themselves on a path to success? Um, even if you know we look at the the news stories, don't always you know uh, paint a, 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 you know the most. Um, you know, a uh, rosy picture of, of, of what's to come. I mean, I, like you, I'm actually kind of optimistic about the humanities. I think we've, we've sort of, I think we've, we've sort of reached the bottom of, uh, of the, 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 the sort of the crisis that, that came out of the, uh, the great recession. And I think we see a lot of disciplines starting to sort of find their way, sort of turn back up in terms of attracting students and that sort of thing. Uh, my worry is that that the students might be coming back to us right at the point when administrators might not be quite so as uh, uh, so convinced about the value of the humanities and in cost cutting moves. I mean, there are a lot of demographic problems that are sort of bearing down on universities. And uh, so I think figuring out how we can make a better case for the humanities would be quite valuable, both at the macro level in terms of making the case to our students and to those sorts of things, but then also figuring out how do we make a good case for our own work. Uh, and being more, much more proactive in 
sort of getting out there, building those networks. Frankly, I think getting online and uh, and engaging in social media and those sorts of things would be all to the good for the the larger health of the field. Yeah, we discussed this a little bit off off air, but I think that also just being aware and cognizant that you know with the giant leap forward in technology um you know we become all the more necessary not all the less necessary and even though that may not always seem to be the case um i think that there are you know there are questions of morality and philosophy that we're now programming into you know into devices whereas before it was kind of just like well if i you know one in a million have a chance come across this dilemma uh you know and it's theoretical whereas now it's actually very practical and and you know, I think that a lot of these social giants uh, um, are are really in crisis right now because they didn't really, they didn't have like a humanities arm or or thought process to some of the decisions they're making. And now there are sort of consequences, not that if they would have included us, everything would have been stellar, but at least some of these thoughts, um, would, some of these, you know, ideas maybe would have been fleshed out a little bit better. Um, and, and I think now it's sort of like, you know, uh, try and come in and clean up and put out some fires. So, you know, it, it may be that we need to, you know, uh, uh, adjust and reinvent ourselves as humanitarians, but not necessarily by giving up who it is that we are, but in really making sure that we're addressing today's most pressing issues. Yeah, and, and connecting to them in, in some ways, I think without giving up our professional, you know, our expertise. Uh, I think figuring out how our expertise can be valuable in the, these sorts of circumstances would be really useful to us. Got it. Robert, thank you so much. This is this has been great. Um, I want to uh, I want to share if anyone wants to contact us, uh, either Robert uh, or myself afterwards, uh, you're welcome to do so. Uh, we'll put up our information here on the screen. Um, you're you're welcome to, uh, to check out our website at www.acklang.com. Also welcome to email me uh, if you have any follow-up. Um, also welcome to reach out uh, to Robert. He's active uh, on Twitter as well. So definitely make sure to check him out there. Check out Humanities Indicators. Um, and, uh, you know, don't, don't be a stranger. Be in touch. Um, I also want to encourage everyone to check out our upcoming events, as I mentioned. Uh, we have an event every every month. Uh, there's an event with without fail. Uh, even when I try to take off August, somehow uh, we end up with events in August as well. So uh, we've got uh, coming up in July, uh, Beth Louie is going to be talking about successfully turning your dissertation into a book or a series of articles. Um, she is the author of the handbook on academic writing. So she's the author go-to authority in the field. And then in uh, in August, we're going to be having a really fascinating conversation about the business side of writing uh, of, of writing academic books. I think we, you know, mo kind of most of us probably assume, well, you know, we're writing it and, and don't expect to make any money off it. Um, and it, while that, you know, sometimes it, it, it is very often the case, there are things that we can do uh, to try and monetize some of the things that we're doing and, and really turn it into, um, you know, public more 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 public fora in order to. Um, in order to succeed. So encourage you to check those out and, you know, keep on and, and, and uh, check out this page because it's constantly being updated uh, with more uh, events. There's also, you can also go on our website and find all the past events are also open uh, for you to check out as well. So be sure to do that. Um, yeah, so maybe, uh, maybe um, uh, Ilana, if you could put up the past events as well, um, that would be great or just throw that in the chat. Um, and also this link so that people can register uh, already now. Um, all right, so I want to uh, get to a few of the questions that we have here in the chat. Um, also, if anyone has any additional questions, uh, now is the time uh, to go ahead and ask them. Um, all right, so uh, Lee Lee Chipman, uh, good, good colleague of mine, uh, has asked, do you have any advice for funding for humanity scholars who are not affiliated with institutions? Uh, especially for people who are beyond the postdoc stage. Yeah, that, uh, I'll tell you, as somebody who tries to maintain a, uh, his own scholarship, uh, I really sympathize with that. And if, if I could figure out how to get good funding for that, I would, uh, I would, I would, I would probably be searching for competing with you myself, but, uh, that one is the one that I, I find I struggle the most with. And if I didn't, my office wasn't near the library of Congress, I don't know what I would do in terms of, uh, because you know when they, you get cut off of those uh, digital um, sort of resources, it's just amazingly difficult. So I, I've actually thought of going back and teaching one, you know, teaching some adjunct for one class just so I could reconnect to uh, to those sorts of resources. Because 
there are precious few resources for those of us who are sort of employed outside of academia and it's it's a real challenge yeah yeah not to be negative that's no no it's it's also something that i've learned in 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 you know just the 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 world of independent scholarship um there's a lot first of all there's a lot more um independent scholars than i was aware than when we started this um interview series um you know i i got some pushback because we didn't have a when you're signing up there was no category that said independent scholar and i quickly you know we quickly corrected that and i think that was really important um, but I don't think that I myself knew how large of a, you know, of, of, of a group that really is. And, and they're really kind of without any support. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that, um, needs to be, needs to be addressed. And I think someone who does that in a serious way, um, will benefit them and, and benefit, um, everyone. Um, especially as jobs just become more and more difficult to, to obtain. Um, do you, Aaron, want, and Aaron, I, I'm not sure that I, Fully understand the question, so uh, hopefully, hopefully Robert does. Uh, but if not, you're welcome to to jump in here and clarify. Uh, but Aaron asks, do you have any advice about bragging about federal uh, funding success (NEH) to local government agencies? Um, I guess what Aaron's trying to do, if I understand correctly, is he wants to be able to kind of use his uh, his grant uh, to be able to promote, uh, kind of work backwards, to be able to promote humanities uh, among local government. You know, I, I think, you know, one, one of the piece, other pieces of advice I probably should have mentioned was just that, you know, when I do advocacy for the NEH and the Humanities on the Hill, um, it it's re often reminds me that people really should do, if, when they get an NEH grant, they should connect with their comms, the comms team of their institution and get them to do some promotion of their work as well. Because, I mean, they've got their own resources and, you know, they spend a lot of time I mean, A, they're often sort of looking for something to promote and they spend a lot of time promoting the, the sciences. And so they have some experience with how to make these sorts of cases to the, the different sort of units that are seem, seem relevant and appropriate in their communities. So I, that, that would probably be my advice on how to connect with them. I mean, because one of the things that we found really useful was just to encourage people who got an NEH grant to connect with their comms team and or their their dean and have them write a letter of thanks to their local member of Congress uh, just to say, you know, isn't this, you know, just to remind their member of Congress that there's someone in their uh, constituency who's received a grant from the, the NEH. The NEH is valuable. And just to help us, those of us who are in D.C. trying to make the case, um, you know, that, that that sort of thing is serves as a really useful reminder when we when we go back and up and try and pitch for the pitifully small amount of money that uh, the, the NEH gets uh, to, to share around. Got it. Robert, thank you so much. Um, I promise